Very good morning to all of you. The topic of my presentation today is going to be managing patients with chronic persistent pain. So I'm going to um, share this uh, screen. So as I said earlier, the um, I'm going to discuss about the chronic pain. What do you mean by chronic pain? Why do we need to talk about chronic pain and how do you help patients suffering from chronic pain. So what is the definition of chronic pain? Different people define chronic pain in different ways, but the general consensus is that any pain which lasts, persists most of the days or every day in the past six months, that is chronic pain. Because it's a persisting pain, that is something we have to remember. And why, we why are we discussing chronic pain? Because this is one of the most common reasons why an adult seek medical care. It is estimated that around 20% of US population, they have some kind of chronic pain. And I'm sure it's not very different here. We all have different kinds of chronic pain conditions like neck pain, back pain, fibromyalgia, um, and um, rheumatoid arthritis. If you look at pain in cancer in particular, 75% of patients with advanced cancer will suffer from some kind of pain at some point of their life. And two, one third of those patients, they'll have very severe pain, which means that they may not even respond to conventional pain management. That's something we have to be very aware of. That's the reason it is anonymously when we say pain and palate, you often it comes to mind, it's about cancer pain because most often we are dealing with a lot of very complex cancer pain conditions. Many of you are working in general practice and you may be coming across a lot of this kind of musculoskeletal pain. And if you look at the prevalence of musculoskeletal pain profile, this is based on American Association of Family Medicine. These are the different pain conditions which we see in our practice. And if you see at the top is osteoarthritis and then comes rheumatoid arthritis, gout and polymyalgia and uh, SLE and juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. I'm sure it's very similar in our population to those who work in primary health center or at the district level, they, if, if this is one of the most common reasons why a patient would come to your center because they will be having these kind of various musculoskeletal pain syndromes. If you look at the symptoms at end of life care, now this is a study which looked at what are the common symptoms experienced by patient towards the end, uh, end of their life. The, uh, they looked at not just cancer, all end stage conditions common end stage condition. And if you look at various symptoms, pain is at the top. And that's a, another reason that when you talk about palliative care, we say pain and palliative because pain is so common symptom in our palliative care, any palliative care program. And that's the reason we call it as pain and palliative. Now let's understand this patient. Look at this patient. This is a patient, 40 year old, the cancer of buccal mucosa, oral cancer. He complains of severe pain left side of the face. Why do you think this gentleman is having pain? He may be having pain because of the cancer itself. The growing cancer is gnawing and growing. So it can be because of cancer. It can be because of nerve involvement because as the cancer eats into the nerves, trigeminal nerves, you can get pain along the nerves. It can be along the bone the cancer eating into the jaw and the bone pain. It could be because of the infection. You can see a lot of infection here, or it can be because of mucositis. Suppose post-radiation patient has a lot of mucositis. It could be mucositis pain. So how do you help this patient? What you have to remember is the success of any symptom management, specifically when you look at pain management, starts with good assessment. Because once you understand that these are the causes of pain, it, it can, you can understand this only when you do a thorough assessment. So it starts with good assessment. They say that more and more hospitals, they consider pain as the fifth vital sign. And they say quality care means pain is measured and it is treated. So we talk about four vital signs in most hospitals. In many good ho accredited hospitals, they talk about pain as a fifth vital sign. 
pain, pain can be assessed by various synonyms people use to remember how to measure pain. That is a common sense. Uh, what questions to ask but generally we ask about we depend on patient self-report and we ask about what are the uh, provocative factors what are the factors which can reduce which are reducing pain quality of pain is it radiating anywhere how severe is your pain and the temporal duration is it all the time or it started recently and is it there um, uh, period, uh, episodic so you need to understand the time of the pain we also look at additional factors that how is it affecting your work? How is it affecting your quality of life, the activity of daily living? So two things, we because this will really give us a good idea about the impact of pain, which must be the patient must be having because of the, the, you know, this chronic persistent pain. So severity of pain can be measured in, by using various scales. How severe is your pain? It can be understood by understanding the severity of, uh, by a 0 to 10 scale, we call it as numerical rating scale. Because say, if, if 0 means no pain, 10 means maximum imaginable pain, where is your pain now? So that is known as numerical rating scale. If the patient, they don't understand numbers, we can use a, what we call it a severity assessment scale. How much is your pain? Is it mild, moderate, severe, or very severe? So this is another way of assessing pain. This is a scale which we use for children. We call it as warm Baker faces scale. We ask a child, how much is your pain? By looking at this, we ask the child to point out how much, how much they feel. How do they feel today? So this is a one way of assessing pain. Many patients, they don't understand numbers, they may not understand these faces. So we ask simple question because most, most patients, they understand money. So we ask them, is it 25 paise, 50 paise, 75 paise or one rupee? One, one rupee means maximum pain, 25 paise means less pain. So how much is your pain? This is another way of assessing pain. So once we assess the pain, how much, you, uh, how much the pain is there? We often use what we call it as pain mapping. This is a body chart which we use to map pain. So suppose the patient says, I got this pain, pin, uh, pins and needles in my leg, uh, in my foot. So we score it as we mark it on the foot where the pain is and we write a brief note. It is nine out of 10 pain, burning, constant pain and uh, radiating, to, um, radiating to the back or leg like that. So this is how we um, um, map the pain. So a good pain hospitals, where the hospitals, where they really recognize pain as an important priority, they will have in their case sheet pain as a fifth vital sign that will be scored in all the case files, they'll have this. And they'll also have a body chart like this for the mapping of pain. And that's the way to um, help the, because they say that the, when you recognize pain, you treat pain. So that's the reason there's so much of importance is given to pain assessment and pain measurement. Coming back to this gentleman, 40 year old gentleman with cancer of uh, oral cancer, complaining of pain left side of the face. This is a chronic persistent pain. Cancer is a one classic example of chronic persistent pain. So how do you manage pain in these kind of patients? While managing pain, chronic persistent pain, we follow certain basic principles and that helps us to manage pain better. The first principle is giving the drug by the clock. Every medicine, every medication has its duration of action. For example, if I, if I use tramadol, tramadol has a duration of action, eight hours. So you must use tramadol eight hourly. Because it's a chronic pain. If you use one medicine, one drug, one dose at morning and one in the night, what will happen in the afternoon? The patient's pain will come back. So why do you want to subject the patient to this kind of on and off pain? That is not a right way to uh, manage. They say, if you want to manage a good pain management, give the medicine by the clock, depending upon the duration of action. The second principle is give the medicine by the mouth. 
you cannot be writing injections and tell the patient go home and take injections because this is a persistent pain they will require this medication for a long period of time so you you have to plan something which which is easy to take and they can continue to take in the homes so always plan medications which can be given by the home third is individualize the treatment each patient is different each patient's pain severity is different cause of pain is different so each patient you have to assess and decide what medicine to be given for each patient you cannot be you cannot standardize cancer stomach stage 2 this is the medicine it, it's not it doesn't work like that and the fourth very important principle is using the ladder we'll discuss about the ladder in the, uh, in subsequent slides so this is these are the four principles which we follow to manage effectively any chronic persistent pain the world health organization way back in 1986 they introduced this ladder which is known as three step analgesic ladder this was originally introduced for the management of cancer pain and we use this ladder even for managing non cancer pain because this helps us this guides us to decide how to go about using different medications now uh, it starts with step 1 step 1 is non opioids step 2 is weak opioids and step 3 we, uh, we use strong opioids non opioids means paracetamol and non steroidal anti inflammatory medications weak opioids like tramadol and strong opioids we'll come to that individually each of them which step to use it all is determined by the severity of the pain if the patient has mild pain start with step 1 If the patient has moderate degree pain, start with step two. If the patient has severe degree pain, start with step three. Remember that it is the severity of pain which decides which step to start with. It is not the stage of the disease. We don't determine. Suppose the patient has advanced cancer and the patient has mild pain. I'll use step one of the ladder. If the patient has just undergoing investigation, he has a mass here. and we do, we have not yet diagnosed the uh, condition but he has severe pain pain in the of this mass and severe pain in the neck i'll start with step 3 so it's not the stage of the disease which uh, which helps us to decide what what step it is the severity of the pain so depending upon the severity we use the ladder we can go up and down the ladder suppose a patient with like i said a mass in the neck and he says severe pain i start with step 3 now i do the investigation and i find that this patient has got lymphoma and this patient receives chemotherapy and this mass disappears it just dissolves pain will come down once the pain comes down we can move down the ladder we can come to step 1 and sometimes we stop it all together so it's a very sliding ladder going up and down depending upon the severity of pain If you notice, I have added something called psychosocial spiritual support. Now, the pain is, as we know, it's not just the physical pain. Pain can be emotional, social, or spiritual. So that umbrella will always be there over this ladder, addressing the other dimensions of pain. The dimensions like psychosocial and spiritual dimension of pain that should be there as an umbrella over this ladder, which which goes along every step of the ladder. like i said non opioids means paracetamol and non steroidal anti inflammatory medications paracetamol is a very good analgesic if, if it is used properly in the dosage recommended it's not just for pain it's for as an analgesic so you have to use at least 4 to 6 hourly remember i said round the clock so at least 4 to 6 hourly the non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs medications are you know there are selective and non selective nsaids so these are the classic traditional nsaids and these are the highly selective and partially selective in um, non steroidal anti inflammatory medications i'm not going to detail of this most of you are very familiar with the use of this medication these kind of medications and this constitute the step 1 of the ladder what are the different opioids available in india opioids are the group of medications which work on opioid receptors so they are all clubbed under the category of opioids and these opioids can be weak opioids and strong opioids weak opioids as you see in this in this step side uh, left side codeine tramadol tapentadol buprenorphine 
and pentazosin. Now, pentazosin, if you notice, I just put it down. It is not at all a good medicine to be used in chronic persistent pain. It's not at all recommended. Commonly, it is, it is used, it's called as um, um, Fortwin. And many hospitals, they use a lot of Fortwin, but it's not at all a good drug. Yeah, and it's not really recommended. If you come to the strong, strong opioids, we have morphine, fentanyl, methadone. So these are the medications used for in, as a strong opioids. Again, pethidine is not a good medicine. It's very short acting. It's available only in injectable form. So it's not really recommended in chronic persistent pain. So these are the few opioids which are available in India. As I said, these are the step two of the ladder. Weak opioids available in India. Different formulations available. Again, I'm not going into detail. It's just to let you know that this constitutes the weak opioids, the step two of the ladder. Strong opioids constitute the step three of the ladder, morphine, fentanyl, methadone. Morphine, oral morphine, not injectable morphine. Oral morphine remains the gold standard treatment for any chronic persistent pain when the pain is severe. Remember, severe chronic persistent pain, morphine remains the gold standard of treatment globally. And many of you may not be familiar with this concept of using oral morphine, but that remains the drug of choice. The different formulations available in India, immediate release formulations, sustained release formulations and injections. These are different formulations which we use in chronic persistent pain. Injectable morphines we use only when the patient cannot take orally, especially towards end of life care. But otherwise, most of the situations we just use uh, oral morphine. Few things which you must remember as uh, uh, about oral morphine. Morphine duration of action is four hours, so it has to be used four hourly. Normally what we say is that start with 6 a.m., 10 a.m., 2 p.m., 6 p.m., and 10 p.m. Normally, the, the, as if you go by that routine, the next dose will come at 2 a.m. We don't really ask the family to wake the patient up, wake up at 2 a.m. and give the 2 a.m. dose. Rather, we say, give double the dose at bedtime. At 10 p.m., give double the dose and so that patient need not wake up at 2 a.m. And usually it is enough to cover the whole night. This is how we normally follow the uh, uh, prescription. And we talk about rescue dose for breakthrough pain. Now, what is that? What does that mean? It's nothing but when the patient is having baseline analgesia, like four hourly, he is taking morphine. Suppose for some reason he also gets in between acute exacerbation of pain. My, I'm all right otherwise, but sometimes I suddenly get more severe pain in my abdomen. And the patient says that that is known as breakthrough pain. And the medicine which we give at that point of time, that is known as rescue dose. So when your patient is taking four hourly morphine, we always give a prescription of additional dose as a rescue dose. Suppose we tell the patient in between you get pain, please take this extra dose of morphine. So if you look at the example, I've given one example. Suppose the patient is taking 10 milligram morphine tablet. We say, please tell, take 10 milligram morphine four hourly. 20 milligram bedtime, that is double the dose at bedtime, and five, we don't say five to 10, we give beside one, because otherwise patient gets confused. We say 10 milligram in between if you get pain. So this is how the standard prescription looks like. If the pain is not better, we increase the dose by 50% of the previous dose. Suppose patient takes 10 milligram four hourly, like how we prescribe, and you patient goes home after two days, he comes back, says, the pain is still not better, I still have pain. So what I'll do, I'll increase the dose by 50%. So 50% of 10 milligram is five milligram. So I'll make 15 milligram morphine, four hourly, 30 milligram bedtime, and 15 milligram as a rescue dose. So this is how you titrate the dose of morphine. You can go on increasing depending upon the patient's analgesic need. There is no upper limit. Don't, don't worry if patient is already on 30 milligram four hourly and you say, my God, 30 milligram and still pain is not better. What shall I do? It's okay. Increase the dose. Increase by 50%. There's no upper limit. The upper limit is when the patient starts showing 
unacceptable side effects. We'll come to that. That's the time we say, oh, no, I can't go up on morphine. But then if that you reach that limit, you have other ways to manage pain. Don't get work, worry, oh my God, morphine is not working, now what next? So it's not like that. So we have many other ways to manage pain. We'll come to that. But this is how you titrate the dose of oral morphine. Like I said, sustained release is when the patient for some reason cannot, they say too many medicines, doctor, I cannot remember to take four hourly. I, very often I miss the timings and my pain comes back and I don't have anybody in the family to give me four hourly. So many of such issues we convert to sustained release morphine. Remember this is, this is more expensive than immediate release tablet. So what we use in, um, uh, once you know, okay, this is the dose requirement of the patient we convert to sustained release morphine. It is never used for unstable or uncontrolled pain. For unstable pain, always use immediate release tablet. And here again, in between pain, if he gets, we have to use immediate release tablet. We cannot be using sustained release for in between pain because it takes some time, sustained release tablet, it takes some time to work and then it, then it remains the body for a longer period of time. So. For breakthrough pain, for SOS medication, you have to use immediate release tablet. If the patient is on rice tube and you need to crush the tablet, don't release, don't use sustained release morphine. Use immediate release morphine. And how do you convert? Suppose a patient is on oral morphine, 20 milligram four hourly, 40 milligram bedtime, double the dose, and I need to convert to um, sustained release because the patient's compliance will be better. I feel and the patient likes to. Do, Generally, they don't like so, too many tablets. So if you need to convert to sustained release, so his total 24 hours requirement is 20 into six doses. Suppose we four hourly you divide, there are six doses, 20 into six, 120 milligram. And sustained release is usually BD dosage. So 125 BD means 60 in the morning, 60 in the night. So this is how it's going to look like. Morphine, SR, Sustained release, 60 milligram twice daily because the 24 hour dose requirement is 120 milligram. 60 milligram twice daily and morphine immediate release tablet, 20 milligram rescue dose for breakthrough pain. So whenever he gets pain, please give as, um, PRN dose or SOS dosage. So this is how we titrate sustained release. I know many of you are very familiar with transdermal fentanyl patches because that's something very uh, aggressively sold by a pharmaceutical company because it's costly and it, there's a lot of margin of profit. So people like to sell, uh, uh, they, they sell and many doctors, they use easily transdermal patches, but very often it's not used appropriately and we land up in a lot of problems. So we need to understand transdermal patch, how it works. What you have to understand is that when you apply a patch, it's a good, wonderful uh, way to you control pain because once you apply, it works for three days. So if you apply it after three days only, you need to change the patch. And once you apply the patch, it creates, it gets absorbed through the skin and in the subcutaneous tissue, it creates a depot, deposits there. And from there, it goes to the circulation. Now, because of this property, like I said, it works for three days. There are some problems when you have this, this kind of way of functioning. Suppose you need in between, suppose gets, patient gets pain. There's no way you can release extra dose of uh, fentanyl. For that, again, you have to have morphine as a backup. So what we do is when we prescribe fentanyl, we also give some tablets of morphine almost the equivalent dose and you say that in between pain please take morphine so that is the one problem the other few problems latency of action suppose patient is in severe pain i will never use fentanyl as a first line because it won't work immediately for a, when you once you apply the patch it creates a depot works for almost 12 hours it takes before it really starts producing its action in the body so your patient may have to wait until that time. That's not acceptable. So somebody is in severe pain, I'll start a patient on morphine, stabilize, convert to patch, but for 12 hours, I'll continue with morphine. So that is the thing we have to I'm mindful of that. And even if, suppose a patient develops a lot of problems, like in the sense drowsiness, patient is very drowsy with fentanyl. If I remove the patch, the patient will not come out of fentanyl action because the depot has to get depleted. 
So it takes almost 24 hours before a patient is completely out of fentanyl patch. So that's the reason because of its latency of action, unpredictable action, and because it takes 24 hours to come out of fact, it's a depot. It's never used in unstable pain when you don't know how much the patient opioid need is. So in a very stable pain, only we use trans transdermal fentanyl patch. In our kind of weather, again, because of the chain, because of the warm weather, when you apply the patch, often the patch may not stick properly. There'll be very erratic absorption. So it's very unreliable when you talk about in summers. And again, vascularity may change the way drug may get absorbed. The most important thing is that it is very expensive. Most of the patients, when you prescribe a longer period of time, they cannot afford. So that's something you have to be mindful of that when you're using transdermal patches. It is a wonderful medicine, especially in patients with renal failure. It may be a better choice over morphine because it is no active metabolite. And the compliance can be much better in terms of patients need not take every four hourly. That problem is not there. But it may not be useful for very unstable um, acute pain conditions. It's not a very good medicine. We use we reserve fentanyl patch uh, for only conditions where the patient cannot take orally. Suppose patient's oral lesion cannot swallow tablets. We use fentanyl patches. Again, we don't use it for unstable end of life care conditions. Just a few words of methadone. I'm not going into detail of that. It's a very highly potent opioids, opioid as a step three of the ladder. We are still at the step three. And maybe an additional advantage other than working on opioid receptor, it also works on NMDA receptor antagonist. So a lot of added advantage, very excellent medication. But it's never used. Normally, we don't use this as a first line. Some centers they use it, but most of the time we don't use it first time. We start with morphine, and when we have issues of, with the use of morphine, we switch over to methadone as a second line. We call it as opioid reduction. Methadone is a wonderful medicine when we have, when we have very complex neuropathic pain conditions. A lot of neuropathic component to the pain, mixed kind of pain or neuropathic pain, it, it works very well because of this additional action uh, on NMDA receptor antagonist, as an NMDA receptor antagonist. It's never used as a first line. In normal circumstances, we use reserve methadone for opioid rotation. It is available as syrups and tablets. And one more reason that we don't use methadone as a first line is because it has some added problems, which we see very, very specific to methadone, like it is a very prolonged half-life. So very often when you start a methadone, it peaks after four to five days. So many times when we send the patient home, the patient becomes very drowsy in the home. And we sometimes we don't even know, we don't have the means to monitor the patient. Other problem is drug interaction. It interacts with many medications because of the way it gets metabolized and it can cause a lot of problems. And very serious issue is that it caused QT prolongation. And there are reports of sudden death happening with use of methadone. Because of all these prob problems, we reserve methadone only in center. We recommend to use of methadone to centers where we have really highly skilled, trained professionals to use it and the supporting staff to help the patient to use methadone. And that's another reason why I would say it's not as a first line because you should know how to use it, how to monitor the patient. But once you know that, it's a wonderful uh, opioid to be used for chronic persistent pain. Now this patient is confused and at times talking irrelevantly. He's on already on morphine, 10 milligram four hourly, 20 milligram bedtime, bisacodyl as a stimulant laxative, diclofenac, and omeprazole. Why is this patient confused? We have to think about some possible reasons that why this patient is confused. He may be confused because of disease progression going to the brain, because of sepsis, dehydration, because not taking orally uh, enough or oral fluids, dehydration, electrolyte imbalance. Yes, those are the few things which you must think about. 
But one important thing you have to think about when a patient is confused and is on opioid medication is that, is it because of opioids? So which brings, the, which we, makes us think, what are the side effects or the problems which we see with opioid usage? Just to make it simple, I'd like to define opioid problems, side effect versus toxic effect. Side effects you see even with the therapeutic dosage. Even with therapeutic analgesic dosage, when you use opioids, you, you may see some problem, which are known as side effects. And we don't stop opioids normally when the patients show side effects. For example, you see these are, these are the common side effects which you see with opioids. A patient may develop constipation. All opioids, more than 95% of patients, when on opioids, they develop constipation. We don't stop opioid because patients develop constipation. We use laxatives along with opioids to deal with constipation. So if you look at the list of the side effects, constipation is one of the most common side effects which we see with opioids. The next common side effect is nausea and vomiting. They say that it's, it usually see, we see nausea and vomiting in the early first one week of starting opioid, initiating opioids. After one week or 10 days, if patient develops tolerance to nausea and vomiting and they, they don't develop later part of uh, long-term use of opioids. But constipation remains as long as you continue to use opioids. Other very less common problems which you see with opioid usage is urinary hesitancy, tiredness, itching. But remember constipation is one of the most common side effect of use of opioids. So when we say the hands which write opioids should write laxatives. Always prescribe a laxative. And the drug of choice is stimulant laxatives like Visacodin. You may add softness if the stool is very hard. You may use softness. But stimulant laxative is the drug of choice. You may even prophylactically write antibiotic medications. Which will be normally in the first few weeks of uh, opioid initiation. We write antibiotic. And the, drug, the medicine which we commonly prescribe is either metoclopramide or haloperidol and uh, um, dopamine receptor antagonist uh, antibiotic medications like metoclopramide. Toxic effects are the problems which arise when the, the level of medication goes above the therapeutic level. In opioids, when you use opioids and we increase, the, remember I said there is no upper limit to, to in, uh, the use of opioids and you increase 50% each time, go on increasing and you reach a certain level where the patient starts showing toxic effect, then you know, okay, now I cannot go up. Rather, I may need to decrease the dose, dose of opioids. So what are those problems which we see when we are reaching the upper limit of where we can't go further? One is undue drowsiness. When the patient is taking morphine and the patient says, I don't know, doctor, when I'm eating, I go to sleep. While talking, I'm just going off to sleep. This is known as undue drowsiness. Myoclonus. Often the relatives will tell you, report to you, that I don't know, while the patient is sleeping, he just goes into this kind of abnormal movement, jerky movement. This is known as myoclonus. When they report that, you should think, no, is the patient developing toxic? Is the patient reaching the upper limit, the toxic effect? Confusion. If the patient is developing delirium or a confusional state, I will always be looking at the medication chart and look for opioid usage. Is it because of opioids? Respiratory depression, it doesn't happen in the usual dosage which we use for patients in our, in our kind of palliative care setup. Because we always titrate dosage. We don't straight away start with high dose. So respiratory depression happens when patient consumes huge do dose of medicine deliberately and there's a lot of opioid in the system. In normal practice when we titrate the medication slowly up 50% each time like that slowly, patient will develop drowsiness before they de develop respiratory depression. They develop delirium. So in a, before they de develop respiratory depression, there will be features of drowsiness and delirium and then usually they stop taking medicines. So it's a very safe, uh, it's a 
safety kind of thing happening because before that they'll develop undue drowsiness and as a physician when you're prescribing opioid you should give a very clear instruction to the patient and the family if patient develop too much of drowsiness please report to us and we also keep tracking each time when they come we ask this question do you have drowsiness do you have myoclonus do you get bad dreams then you know okay you have a problem respiratory depression is very unusual it's never seen in our palliative care setup if you know how to use the medication in its proper way you see respiratory depression in when you inject morphine iv in a bolus dosage and suddenly the morphine goes to the system patient is on 20 mg morphine 4 hourly 40 mg bedtime and 20 mg sos dosage is on bisacodyl like like we suggested stimulant laxative and omeprazole for some probably some gastritis he's st he's still in pain but the patient says i'm drowsy now here which we do you think we can go up on morphine no because patient is drowsy but patient is in pain what to do now now then that's the time we have to look at why the patient is having pain once again then go back and do your assessment is it a neuropathic pain because many times in neuropathic pain patient may not typically respond to opioids and you may have to other add other medications we call it as adjuvant medication adjuvant medications are the medicines medications which we use to as an analgesic or to deal with the side effects so in neuropathic pain we add medications like anticonvulsant or antidepressant medications to manage neuropathic pain and they are known as adjuvant medication we which we add to the ladder remember the three step ladder along the ladder if the patient has neuropathic pain we add other medicines and that goes along the ladder whichever the ladder you are step of the ladder you are in we add uh, medications for neuropathic pain very often when the patient says my pain is not better better always check the compliance most patients they don't take medicines as per our prescription for various reasons so always check so our policy when the patient comes to our clinic is that can you show me the medicines which you are taking can you explain to me how you are taking how you you taking your medicine so when you do that you will cross check you will identify that most patients they don't take medicine as per our prescription so if you don't understand that and keep on increasing the medicine dose of the medicine you are you are in trouble so check the compliance feeding issues most of these patients when they can't eat when you give medicines half the medicines coming out to the fistula and you if you increase the dose of medicine that doesn't help you have to deal with then how to make sure that the medicine is going in so look at the feeding issues and as i said earlier look at the other dimensions of the pain is it purely the cancer pain which is causing pain to him or is it other Psycho, social, and spiritual dimensions of suffering is adding to his pain. For compliance to treatment, often another reason for poor compliance to treatment is fear of use of opioids. And the patient is prescribed on morphine when they go home, and when they go to their medical shop, and the the pharmacist they say, "Are you mad? Why are you taking these medicines? You'll become an addict." Or when they go to their general practitioner, and he says the same thing. and they stop taking because they are too scared to take it so they say no doctor i don't want this medicine or they sometimes they don't even tell you the truth so you have to explore that explore this so what are the common fears which we see with opioids with whole morphine for the last few days of life don't give it now are you mad he's just in the early stage and he'll get all right why you start him on morphine he's not dying so people think it's only for the last days which is not true because even if you start early days cancer gets all right you can stop morphine but if he has severe pain he will require morphine morphine hasten step are you mad he'll die if he takes morphine again this is a myth doesn't happen like that in fact when you take morphine your pain is better you eat better you sleep better your overall quality of life improves you live longer we have there several studies to substantiate that so it, it's not that morphine hasten step and you know how to use morphine in its dosage which is uh, appropriate for the patient morphine cause addiction biggest fear because this is something which we learn in our pharmacology 
textbook and we stuck with that notion, morphine causes addiction. There are several studies which have shown again and again when addiction is not likely, so long as oral morphine is used in opioid responsive pain, in doses, adequate for pain to be. Now this is one study which was done in Indian context, which was done in Kerala way back in 2001, where they looked at more than 1000 population and looked at the patients who were receiving morphine and they looked at their um, profile and they found that addiction was not an issue. Because there, there are various reasons why they say that, but remember that oral morphine, when it's used for pain in appropriate dosage, addiction does not happen. Very few, very small number of patients may have some issues around dependence, but majority of patients, it's not an issue so long as you know how to use it, how to prescribe, how to monitor, and how to follow up. It is not an issue. Normally, we spend a lot of time when we opio prescribe opioids, educating the patient around how to take, how to uh, 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 space it out, how to take that extra dose, what is the purpose. So we use this kind of medication chart and we, our nurses, our counselors, even doctors, we spend a lot of time educating the patient and the family around its usage. Like I said, all pain cannot be treated with morphine. We use a lot of other adjuvant medications for pain relief. Steroids, especially when there's a lot of inflammation and edema, we use steroids. Tricyclic antidepressants and anticonvulsants, typically we use for neuropathic pain. We use ketamine. Ketamine is actually an anesthetic drug, but we use ketamine for chronic pain conditions. Suppose you have a skeletal muscle spasm. Suppose you um, slept in a not a good posture and morning you get up with a stiff neck, use skeletal muscle relaxant, not morphine. Suppose you have a spasmodic pain for some reason, for some colitis, use smooth muscle relaxants. So different medi for different kind of pain conditions, you may use this pain, the medicine which is relevant to that kind of pain condition. So for all these conditions, morphine may not be the choice. All chronic pain, don't just be in a hurry to start medications. Always think about the non-pharmacological approach to manage pain because it's a long-term problem and you have to look at how, how is the best possible way to improve the patient's quality of life and improve the patient's way of living, modifying the lifestyle. So look at those means to help the patient. Physical therapy and rehabilitation plays a very critical ro role in all non-cancer pain conditions. Remember I showed you different non-cancer pain conditions in the beginning. All of those conditions, the first approach would be find the ways to physically rehabilitate the patient with physical therapy and other means. Now blocks may have a role in small percentage of patients. They say 90% of patients you can manage with medications. Only 10% of patients may require some kind of interventional procedures to manage pain. Always look for complementary therapy. It always, it's, it's, it's helpful. And many in our culture, in, uh, in our context, people like to do that. It's a part of our life. So I encourage them to do that. It always adds value to your other ways of managing pain. So always look for ways to manage with other means of um, therapy. Remember always pain and coming back to this concept that pain is not just physical. Pain is emotional, social and spiritual. So when you're looking at chronic persistent pain, I, like I said, do not be in a hurry to manage pain with medications. Look at all the dimensions of suffering, address to those other dimensions of suffering and your overall experience of pain will come down. When you're using medications, use what we call it as universal precaution. Drug screening, look at their habits. Do they have habits about uh, uh, drug uh, uh, recreational use of medications? Always check for that because there is risk for them this kind of behavioral issues. 
always prescribe in small quantities, make frequent follow up, check on what they're doing. Use single pharmacy for, to prescribe. If they have, if the patient knows there are too many doctors prescribing, they, they may go because they are desperate in pain. They may go to different, different doctors, collect a lot of medicines, and often that leads to a lot of confusion and improper medications, and that doesn't help. And always when the patient comes back, ask them to bring back the tablets and you can count and you know whether the patient is taking medications properly or not. So these are the standard precautions when you use, always it's helpful to, uh, to deal with such uh, issue. The idea was to give this kind of overview about managing chronic persistent pain. Thank you.